Hi, I'm Ben with uh, Grace Community Church. I'm one of the pastors here, and I wanted to thank you for watching this sermon. I pray that it serves you well, that it will help you grow in your understanding of God's Word, the Bible, that it will deepen your love for Christ and help you to pursue holiness in your own life. And we are glad that you're here watching this video, but uh, we, we also pray that this video would not be a, a replacement for your own local church and sitting under the preaching and teaching of your own pastor. But we do pray that it, it helps you, that it edifies you. If you have any questions about this sermon or our church in general, feel free to visit our website, gracecommunitychurchberea.com, and hit the Contact Us button. We'll be happy to help you in any way that we can. And may God be glorified through your listening to this sermon. Paul was concerned. The latest message from Philippi was disturbing. Word has come to him that cracks are starting to develop in the church. Division and strife are threatening the fragile unity of the church, but he has a problem. He's chained to a Roman soldier. He's under house arrest. In different times, under different circumstances, he would immediately make plans to go to Philippi and help them navigate through the choppy waters they were facing. Of course, he's concerned for them. He has many friends there. He loves them. They love him. He has ministered to them, and they have ministered to his needs many, many times. And because of his affection for them, he is deeply concerned for them. But his greatest concern is for the advancement of the gospel. He is afraid that if unity and strife continue to grow inside the church, he knows that the gospel advancement will be slowed, maybe even halted. Well, the good news is that even though he's in chains, his hands are not tied. So he does what he can. He picks up his pen and puts it to paper and begins to offer counsel to them by way of the written word. And now he's not searching for his theme. He's not searching for where to begin. He knows exactly where he needs to begin. He knows exactly the issue that needs to be addressed. He knows he must go directly to the heart of the matter. He understands that the root of strife is pride. He knows their unity is threatened by their wrong thinking. The problem has been created by getting their priorities out of order and thinking of themselves more than they think of others and not counting others more significant than they, they are counting themselves. And he also understands until their thinking has been corrected, until they begin to think properly, they will never act properly. But it wasn't so much a lecture that they needed. What they needed was a lesson. They needed a living lesson. They needed a flesh and blood lesson. They didn't need a lecture on humility. They needed a living lesson on humility. They needed an example that they could look to. They needed an example that they could meditate on. They needed an example that they could look to frequently. Of course, the example that Paul has in mind would immediately smash their pride. It would melt all resistance away and so that they would be able to live in humility and thereby have unity with one another. And of course, we know the example that Paul has in mind is the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about the Lord Jesus Christ. He went from the Savior. He went from the sovereign to a servant to the Savior. And the example of the Lord Jesus that Paul is going to show them, is teach them, demonstrates to them that God is not going to ask them to do anything that he wasn't ready to ask his son to do. In fact, indeed, that he had asked his son to do, and his son had done it. And of course, there's no better example than the one Jesus provides for us. Jesus provides all believers, all places, at all times, with a very vivid and very dramatic demonstration of the humility that promotes and creates unity. 
And Paul does this by describing a series of downward steps that Jesus took. A series of steps that took Jesus from the glory that he had eternally shared with his Father to the grave. And from there, the Father exalted him to rule and reign as Lord. Again, Jesus made the journey from a sovereign to a servant, to Savior, to Lord of all. You're God. You're all-powerful. Your power is unlimited. Your power knows no boundaries. You are totally self-sufficient. You have never been contained or constrained in any way. Your existence cannot, will not, ever be threatened. You've never needed any kind of help. You will never need any kind of help. You are God. Yet God, through an intentional act of his will, placed himself in the womb of a young teenage girl. With intention, the creator, not only of mankind, but of everything that exists, became a part of his creation. So well, how did this happen? Well, Paul describes here in our text what Jesus did in order to become a man. Paul describes the humility that Jesus displayed in order to become one of us, in order to live among us, so that he could die for us. So Jesus, who from all of eternity has existed in the form of God, He was God. To be in the form of God is equal to being God. John MacArthur says, Jesus was equal to God the Father in every way. Jesus Christ is, always has been, and will forever be divine. Paul emphasized this truth of the Colossians. He said, He, referring to Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all Creation, yet Jesus, the firstborn of all creation, in a tremendous display of humility and a tremendous act of humility, did not count or did not consider his divine equality something to be grasped. Jesus didn't see the need to hold on to that equality. He didn't see it as something that he had to cling to. And what very well may be, has to be, the grandest act of selflessness. Jesus refused to cling to his favored position of power and glory. And then contrast that with the human race. When people find themselves in positions of power, more often than not, they will do whatever it takes to hold on to that position of power. Whether it be a politician who is long past their prime, but yet continues to run for office. Why? They're intoxicated by the power. It could be a CEO of a company who's no longer fit to run the company, but because he loves the power, he hangs on to the power. It can happen as parents with our children. We've had power to a degree over our children's lives, and sometimes we don't want to give up that power. It happens through all strata of society. We love power. We crave power. And many times we will even go to illegal lengths in order to hang on to that power. But Jesus didn't do that. His attitude must also be our attitude. Every believer should display the same level of selflessness, meaning that we are willing to give up whatever is necessary for the sake of others. We are willing to count others. To count others simply means to consider others more significant than ourselves. And this is important because it is one way that we demonstrate that we actually do possess the mind of Christ. It's important because it's one way where we demonstrate that we are actually in Christ. It's, it's an 
outcome of our union with Christ. Therefore, if we just can't do this, or we won't do this, we need to seriously consider our profession of faith. Because, as we saw last week, what we do as believers is simply exercise the mind of Christ that we already possess through our union with Christ. So it should be our attitude. And Jesus proved that he was not willing to cling to his divine prerogatives by emptying himself and taking on the form of a servant. Now, as you you might imagine, this particular passage and this verse in particular has uh, caused a certain degree of uh, controversy and confusion down through the years in the history of the church, but I don't believe that it, it needs to do that. The key is really properly understanding that phrase, emptied himself. The word emptied means abased. Here's what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that Jesus emptied himself of his deity. It does not mean that Jesus exchanged his deity for humanity. Jesus did not swap out his divine nature for a human nature. When Jesus emptied himself, he set aside for a time some of his divine rights, some of his divine prerogatives, and he added something to himself. He gives up some things for a time, but at the same time, he adds something to himself. He takes on, Paul says, the form of a servant. So when Paul says that he came and he emptied himself, and he says he took on the form of a servant, ser- servant, excuse me, again, he's not losing anything. He's actually taking something on. Dennis Johnson comments, Christ was and remains equal with God, but he did not regard that equality as a perk to be exploited for his own advantage, a windfall, a fortuitous springboard to be used for self-promotion. See, when Jesus emptied himself, he did no way diminish his deity. When Jesus became a man, he never became fully less than God. Now, there are those who will say that, yes, Jesus emptied himself of his deity. But there's a huge problem with that. And here's the huge problem. If he emptied himself of his deity, then he could not die on the cross for our sins. Only God could die on the cross for our sins. So be very careful about wanting to rob Jesus of his deity because you rob him of his potential as your Savior. So we need to be careful about that. If he had ceased to be God, he would not have been able to die on the cross. He would not have been able to die for the sins of the world. And you think about who Paul is writing this to, Philippi, a Roman colony. Rome was tolerant of all kinds of false gods and false practices. As long as you recognize Caesar as Lord, you could pretty much do anything else that you wanted. And these false gods, these pagan deities, they weren't known for being benevolent. They were always making demands of those who worship them. They were always having to be appeased. This is the way the mind of man works when it creates a false god. I've got to keep that god happy. They didn't see these false gods as being willing to give up anything on their behalf. Yet, what do we have here? What a contrast this must have been to the believers at Philippi that, hey, here is a God who willingly emptied himself on my behalf. Here is a God who is willing to give give up the exercise of what was rightfully his for the sake of others. And I think that based upon our limited understanding, granted our limited understanding of the Lord's actions, we should take the time to try as best that we can, to gain some kind of a perspective on the depth that Jesus lowered himself to in the incarnation. And for just a moment, let's just try and fathom. Let's just try and think about the vast, even the infinite gap that exists between God and us. Think about that chasm that exists between Jesus and his creation. And let's say that we, as uh, the human race, uh, we're a proud people, right? 
And we think we're all that at times. And so we may be tempted to think, well, we will go to the four corners of the earth and we will find our best, our brightest, our noblest. We will go into the halls of power. We will go into the university academic setting and find the best and the brightest. We will go to royalty. We'll pull all of them out and we'll say, here, look at us. Do you think they even begin to compare to the glory and the majesty of Jesus Christ? Not at all. If there was a scale to be judged, it wouldn't even register on the scale. We are as nothing in comparison to Jesus Christ. He is glorious. We're not. He is majestic. We are not. He is magnificent. We are not. He is Lord. And we are not. There's this tremendous gap that exists. And Paul says, I, I know you think you're pretty special. But at the same time, he says, that is completely the wrong attitude for you to have as a Christian. You know, we, we say to ourselves, you know what? We deserve respect. No, we deserve more than respect. We deserve to be honored. And then Paul comes along and blows us out of the water and says, nope, not if you're a Christian. That's completely the wrong attitude for you as a Christian to have. You need to count others, all others, by the way. Can I, can I, can I highlight this for you? We are to count all others more significant than ourselves. We are to put the needs of all others ahead of ourselves. There, Paul didn't give us any qualifications here. Say, does this apply to the person whose politics I don't like? Yes. Does this apply to the person who hurt me or hurt my children? Yes. Does this apply to my neighbor who won't cut his grass and has a junk car in the driveway? Yes. Yes. It applies to all without qualification. So I wonder, what was your reaction when you hear words, hear those words from Paul? Did you immediately think of somebody else who needed to hear that? And say, boy, I wish, I wish so-and-so was here. Man, they really need to hear that. They think they're all that, that little arrogant punk. Yeah, they, they really need to hear this. Or perhaps those words raised your own blood pressure. And perhaps there was a person that, you, that came immediately came to your mind and you thought to yourself, never in my wildest dreams would I ever conceive of putting their needs before my own. I wanted to Paul's words offend you. And if they did, why? I can answer the question for you. One word, pride. Pride. When pride rears its ugly head, that's when you and I need to call to mind the actions of Jesus, and we need to think long and hard about what Jesus did for us. And when is the last time you spent any amount of time at all meditating on the magnificence and the majesty of Christ? When is the last time you spent time marveling that Jesus is God, that Jesus is God Almighty, that Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of all life? When is the last time you rehearsed the mighty acts of God and made a beeline to Jesus? Go back through the Old Testament, some of the miracles there, absolutely astounding, powerful acts of God. That's Jesus. Children of Israel are facing the waters of the sea. In the words of Russ Taft, they can't run, they can't hide. Though he was just a man, Moses raised his hand and the Lord came through. What did he do? He parted, this, parted the waters. Jesus parted the waters. We just went through Daniel last summer, I think. Daniel in the lion's den. Jesus was there. Fiery furnace, Jesus was there. See, I'm afraid we, we, we focus on Jesus the man sometimes and forget that Jesus is God Almighty. Jesus is the one who stilled the storm. 
heal the lepers, give sight to the blind, raises the dead. Yes, Jesus is a man, but he's also God. And that all-powerful God not only became a servant, he took on the very essence, the very nature of a servant, but not just a servant, but a bond servant. And a bond servant owed absolutely nothing. They didn't have a house. They didn't have land. They didn't have a bank account. They had, most of the time, they didn't even own their own clothes. But he came in the form of a bond servant. He served us as a bond servant. Who was it that washed the feet of the disciples? Scour that account. Study that account. You don't see any hint of that Peter or John or any other disciple was ready to get up and wash his feet. No, it was the one who created the disciples who knelt before them and washed their feet. He came in the form of a servant. The Son of Man, the Bible says, came not to be served, but to what? Serve. D.A. Carson writes, The eternal Son did not think of his status as God as something that gave him the opportunity to get and get and get. Instead, his very status as God meant he had nothing to prove, nothing to achieve. And precisely because he is one with God, he made himself nothing and gave and gave and gave. I love that. He abandoned his rights. He became a nobody. And what did Jesus do being found in human form? He became obedient, meaning he simply did everything that the Father asked him to do. Jesus fulfilled every one of the righteous demands of God's law. Jesus always did those things that pleased the Father. Jesus did what Adam failed to do. Jesus did what you and I refused to do. He lived a life of perfect obedience to the Father. But Paul takes it even further. Not only was he obedient, he was obedient to the point of death. And why did the Lord's obedience take him to the point of death? Because it was the Father's will. Commentator Ralph Martin writes, His obedience is a sure token of his deity and divine authority. For only a divine being can accept death as obedience. For ordinary men, it is a necessity. He alone, as the obedient son of his father, could choose death as his destiny. And he did so because of his love, a love which was directed both to his father's redeeming purpose and equally to the world to which he came. And he closes with this phrase, I came to do thy will was the motto text of his entire life. That was the, that was the driving force of the Lord Jesus. He came to do the Father's will. But Paul goes further still. He, Jesus became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Do you realize that the Father did not have to force Jesus to die on the cross? Have you ever thought about that? He willingly went to the cross out of love for His Father, out of His desire to obey the Father. He willingly went to the cross. The Father did not have to force Him to go to the cross. Such was a demonstration of love and humility by the Lord Jesus. And we hear those words today, death on a cross, and their impact it just kind of bounces off of us, I'm afraid. We wear crosses around our neck. We build some church buildings in the form of a cross. We'll put it on the back of our car. We've softened the cross of its horror. We've softened the cross and robbed the cross of just how unbelievably cruel it was. And Jesus came into the world knowing that was how He was going to die. The shadow of the cross was with Jesus from the day He was born till the day that he died. And crucifixion in the Roman Empire was reserved for slaves and rebels and those who had been branded enemy of, enemies of the state. It was a horrific death. It was a torturous death. It was a cruel death. It was considered so barbaric that if you were a Roman citizen, uh, you couldn't be crucified. And again, part of the horror of the cross was the fact that Jesus knew what lay before him. He knew the open shame that he would have to bear. He knew the excruciating pain he would have to endure. And most painful of all would be the separation that for all of eternity, he would experience for the very first time, for the first time in eternity, Jesus, the Son of God, would be separated from God, his Father. 
What is it about death that causes us such pain? Even as believers, what is it about death that causes us so much pain? It's the loss of that companionship. It's the loss of that fellowship that we've had with that person, particularly of our loved ones. I was saying in the first service, that this, this forcefully came to me when I was 19 or 20 years old. And we used to have a dinner before, I think it was called Great Commission Night. I don't really remember, not important. But we used to have a dinner and we'd set up in a gym and people would come. We'd have this dinner before we'd go out and make Sunday school calls or whatever it was. I remember walking in there one night and I saw a man by the name of Lloyd Jones. And his wife had just passed away and they had been married 40 or 50 years, possibly more. And I'll never, I can see it, I can see it as if I'm there today. That man sitting there at an eight foot table all alone. And it hit me, death is real. Here's a man for the first time in decades was alone. The one we love through death is no longer physically present. The pain overwhelms us as we look at that empty chair at the dinner table. The pain overwhelms us when we see their side of the bed and know that the covers will never be disturbed again. The pain of death overwhelms us when we know we'll never hear the creaking of their favorite chair again. And Jesus and the Father for all of eternity had enjoyed the company of each other. But for the first time in all of eternity, that eternal joyful fellowship was broken, which resulted in this forlorn plaint of cry being ripped from the lips of Jesus. And what did he say? My God. My God, why have you forsaken me? Well, that's the humiliation of Jesus, but thankfully the story doesn't end there. His humiliation was followed by his exaltation. Look at verse 9. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Let's read that again. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. Notice carefully what Paul says. This took place through the direct action of God. God the Father Father was responsible for our Lord's exaltation. God the Father did not just exalt the Son. He highly exalted the Son. He raised the Son to the utmost heights of glory, power, majesty, and dominion. God raised up his son. God lifted up his son and freely and graciously gave him the name that is above every name. You say, well, what is the name? Paul doesn't give us the name. Keep reading verse 11. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is what? Lord, that's the name. That's the name that the Father has given to the Son. He has highly exalted him to the position of absolute, unchallengeable, Authority, authority, prestige, and power. And because Jesus Christ is Lord, regardless of their location, regardless of their position, will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Everyone. No exceptions. The rich will confess. The poor will confess. The powerful will confess. The weak will confess. The downtrodden will confess. The proud will confess. The atheist will confess. The agnostic will confess. The religious liberal will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I find that to be a rather comforting thought, knowing that right now, not sometime in the future, but right now, Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning. It's such a comforting thought to know that Jesus Christ is ruling and reigning over the universe and all that is in it. To know that Jesus is Lord helps me, frankly, maintain my my sanity in an insane world. But 
Jesus as Lord is a comforting thought for believers, but it's also a th sobering thought for the unbeliever, though they don't recognize it. It's sobering to think that for many, their confession of Jesus as Lord will come entirely too late. If they don't bow the knee in this life and confess Jesus as Lord and Savior, their confession will come too late. It will be a confession of eternal damnation. It will be the confession of the damned. All those who mock God now, go ahead, Mr. Hollywood celebrity. Go ahead, Mr. Politician. Go ahead and mock God now. You'll regret it someday. Go ahead and deny God now. Go ahead and blame God now. One day you will bow. And the Christ who could have saved them will instead judge them. And he will be a judge that on that day will show no mercy. Depart from me. I never knew you. Jesus, Lord, is a comforting thought because it points us to a time when all things that trouble us will forever cease to trouble us. I like that. Jesus, is Lord, gives us hope. We can't live without hope. We need hope. Hope that our circumstances will change. Hope that heaven awaits. Physical and mental illness will no longer plague us. Strife and unrest will be replaced with peace and harmony. There'll be no more death, no more pain, no more war, no more hunger, no more loneliness, no more divorce, no more rebellious children, no more strife, no more discord. When you think of Jesus, Lord, think about those words, no more. Because Jesus is Lord someday, no more. No more pain, no more sickness, no more poverty, no more hunger, no more injustice. No more. Jesus is Lord. And because Jesus is Lord, we pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus.